Yeah, th this uh, uh, project had its genesis really in uh, some conversations that I had with my colleague, uh, Hassan Jeffries, uh, an African-American historian uh, at Ohio State. Uh, and you know, he was talking about the, his work with black self-defense groups, and I was talking about my work as, mil as a military historian, and we realized that in kinds of ways we were talking about the same thing. And so some years ago we organized uh, a conference called the War for the American South, 1865 to 1965. Uh, and the idea of the, looking at the Civil Rights Movement as an insurgency is an outgrowth of that. Now the presentation that you're going to see tonight is a presentation that I gave at the U.S. Army War College when I was a visiting professor uh, there in 2008, between 2008 and, and 2010. And this may not, and bear in mind that you're dealing with a pretty conservative uh, crowd there where uh, Yingling is the official beer and Fox News is the official uh, uh, you know, news station. So, so to begin with it, you know, I needed to, to start with an icebreaker and of course, you know, geez, not this liberal crap again, which is probably not something that's, that's necessary here at Wright State, though one never knows. But, uh, but anyway, it's there anyhow. Now, well, well, why, you know, it's unusual to think of the civil rights movement as an insurgency. And let me get one objection out of the way right now, and it's sort of an additional one to the ones that I'm going to show you. And that is in the post-9-11 era, insurgency has, has acquired a pejorative, term, uh, pejorative uh, uh, connotation because the United States has been fighting insurgencies in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and so on. But insurgency is a neutral term. The United States itself grew out of a successful insurgency between 1775 and 1783. So, uh, so one, one you know, cannot really object to calling the civil rights movement an insurgency on those particular grounds. But there are other reasons why you might think that the civil rights movement you know, it was not an insurgency. Uh, one of them is that, you know, it wasn't a war. You know, how could it have been a war when, it's, uh, uh, you know, when it was, when it was non-violent? Uh, well, to say that it was, that was, that it was not a war uh, runs up against certain objections that I'll get to in a moment. The second objection is that it was non-violent. You know, well, the other side had violent means at its disposal and didn't hesitate to use them. The third objection is that it had strong support from the, the, the American government. So if it had so much support from on high, how could it have been an insurgency uh, coming from below? Well, let me answer those three uh, questions. First objection, that it was not war. Well, war is the continuation of politics by other means. This is Karl von Clausewitz, the famous Prussian military uh, theorist. And there are two basic kinds of war, according to uh, a retired uh, Marine Corps general, uh, General Paul Van Riper. Uh, wars of maneuver and wars of insurgency. Now, wars of insurgency are often waged by groups that are excluded from the normal political process. One of the ways of looking at this is the idea of revolutionary crisis. That it, at most times and most places, uh, the inhabitants, uh, the population of a given country, whether they like the form of government that is there or not, whether it's a democracy or whether it's a dictatorship, uh, obey the tenets of that political uh, system. And, uh, and as long as that obedience is in place, you don't have a, a revolutionary crisis. But you, can, you do have a revolutionary crisis at the point where a group or gr uh, that, that's excluded from the ordinary political process of that system you know, tries to gain access to that system by different means or to overthrow that system entirely. And this is the case that obtained with uh, African Americans living in the American South who were excluded almost completely from the political process because of the segregationist uh, order that existed in the American South uh, from Reconstruction on down to the mid-1960s. Uh, if you know, if this uh, uh, insurgency had used violent means or if this movement had used violent means, nobody would, uh, would fail to say that it was uh, an insurgency. The second objection, that it was nonviolent, well, overlooks the fact that segregationist regimes did not hesitate to use violence. And they used it in major kinds of ways. Uh, it's also... 
you also need to be aware, really, that it was important for to use strategy and tactics that had to be effective against an opponent that had a monopoly on state violence. That is to say, um, you've got the state highway patrol, you've got local law enforcement agencies, you've got uh, the National Guard when it was under state service rather than federal service. So you have a tremendous amount of firepower on the part of your adversaries. And this, this, uh, uh, this adversary also made systematic use of something that we can call lawfare. Lawfare is the use of the legal system to intimidate, block, and if necessary, imprison opponents. And so you have this guy here. His name is uh, Frank Cherchoisky. Difficult name to, to pronounce. Now, here's this inoffensive-looking man. He's a, he, this is during Freedom Summer in 1964. And he's got this little placard here that says, Voter Registration Worker. Actually, a little bitty, little bitty sign and so on. Well, he was arrested and put in jail for several days without trial and so forth for carrying a placard, you know, which is supposed to be a big old billboard, you know, that you wear on your body, without a permit just for having this particular thing. Stokely Carmichael of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, arrested really for, for just uh, you know, speaking out uh, and then any number of African Americans during the course of the Civil Rights Movement uh, you know, jailed uh, for their roles in protesting against uh, segregation uh, and the exclusion of African Americans from the political process. If you reframe the issue in terms of strategy rather than in terms of violence, then the civil rights movement looks more like an insurgency. And you know, this tracks back to the ideas of Sun Tzu. And you, know, and, uh, and you can see that you know, many people read Sun Tzu, uh, including uh, Paris Hilton, you know, a good copy of this is, this is, in fact, the best edition of uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War that is available. So she has very good taste uh, in this matter. So Sun Tzu, what does he say? For to win 100 victories and 100 battles is not the acme of skill. To subdue the enemy without fighting is the acme of skill. Another way of looking at the, the, uh, the civil rights movement uh, is that it used tactics that have been described as political jiu-jitsu. And if you think, I don't know if people are, are, know anything about jiu-jitsu. Just, okay, well I'm going to show you. You know a little bit about it? Okay. It's all based on leverage. That's exactly right. It's all based on leverage. And one of the things I liked about it, one of the ways I got interested in jiu-jitsu was when I was first taught by, it, by a, guy, a friend of mine who, who runs a martial arts academy in Norfolk. And he had me start off like this. Okay? Now, this is a position that I found myself in very often on, the, you know, on, high, on uh, uh, elementary school playgrounds. But what he, you know, what he taught me was how to, how to, you know, to take an opponent uh, and by... You know, using your arms in a certain kind of way and using your leg to trap their leg and so forth and rearing up and going over, anybody of any size can be moved over. That's because the human body can only move in certain kinds of, in certain kinds of ways. No matter how big you are, how strong, you know, this, this arm is only going to move in a certain kind of direction before it's going to want to break. And that, that tends to make people want to tap out, makes them want to quit. So the Civil Rights Movement made use of the leverage, you know, its understanding of American society and, 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 of, uh, and of Southern segregation society, avoided its strong points, exploited its weak points, and employed what can, what can, you know, what can accurately be called political jiu-jitsu. Also, the movement was not entirely nonviolent. This was something that was carefully hidden uh, during the period of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, itself, the existence of black self-defense groups. Uh, so you have Robert F. Williams who ran the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, uh, in Monroe, North Carolina, and wound up writing an influential manifesto uh, having to do with, you can see the subtitle here, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the name of the book was Negroes with Guns, and the subtitle is Self-Respect, Self-Defense, and Self-Determination. And there he is teaching his wife how to use a pistol. Here on the right, you have the Deacons for Defense and Justice holding up uh, Ku Klux Klan um, uh, hoods. These were veterans of the Second World War and of the Korean War uh, who uh, defended their neighborhoods against encroachments by the Ku Klux Klan and were well known to do so and so were left alone. They also provided some, some, some protection uh, for nonviolent civil rights groups. Third objection, that it had strong support from 
the U.S. government. Well, look at all these pictures that suggest that that's the case. And when you read American history text, textbooks, the civil rights movement is so telescoped uh, in these textbooks that you've got, you know, very, very quickly, um, the civil rights movement as a, as a, as a nonviolent resistance movement, and then hard on the heels of that, the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so it looks as though the federal government is very much involved with this. The film Mississippi Burning. How many people have ever seen the film Mississippi Burning? Okay. Yeah, this is complete BS. Because what it, what it postulates, what it, what it has at the heart of it, uh, is uh, uh, the efforts of you know, two FBI agents to bring to justice at all costs uh, Ku Klux Klansmen uh, in an area of, uh, of Mississippi. This just didn't happen. Uh, the, the, the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, explicitly said that the, that the FBI was not an investigative agency and did not protect uh, civil rights uh, workers. And when this film came out, poor old Gene Hackman was on Nightline sort of trumpeting its virtues, and then they had uh, veterans of the civil rights movement come on and it basically explain to him in, in, you know, in, in great detail just how wrong the film, film was and how inaccurate it was and how infuriating it was because over and over again they had had demonstrations, there had been FBI agents sitting by and all they did was just take notes on what was going on. They didn't do anything to assist. So, toward a case for insurgency you've got to accurately understand the stance of the American government and that includes, that's of course in three parts. You've got up here uh, the, the executive branch, Dwight D. Eisenhower, you've got uh, uh, the Supreme Court, and you've got uh, Congress. Let's look at each in turn, the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judiciary branch. Take the judiciary branch uh, first. Brown versus Board of Education, right? 1954 decision, uh, struck down, um, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, uh, basically argued that uh, uh, segregation of public schools was inherently uh, unequal and the, the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision was uh, implicitly a blow struck against all forms of legal segregation. But there was a second, de second decision uh, made by the same court called Brown II uh, and Brown II said that, that uh, desegregation had to occur in, or in, uh, um, uh, in schools with all deliberate speed. And this was designed as a sop to southern moderates, but what it did was it, it slowed uh, the pace of, of, uh, edge of integration down to a glacial pace uh, and uh, created conditions in which uh, more extremist southerners, white southerners, were encouraged to resist uh, this movement toward desegregation through a policy that they called massive resistance. The executive branch. Here again is, uh, is Dwight D. Eisenhower. Here is President John F. Kennedy with Martin Luther King. That's, that's Eisenhower with Earl Warren of the, the Supreme Court. And here, but here is President Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, the Attorney General, with uh, the director of the, uh, of the FBI, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover was deeply uh, racist and deeply suspicious of the civil rights um, uh, organization. Uh, he got the Kennedy administration to authorize wiretaps on uh, the on Martin Luther King, on his offices, uh, eventually on hotel rooms where he stayed, uh, and uh, um, eventually got to the point where these various these various wiretaps were put together uh, in such a way as to to demonstrate that. Uh, Martin Luther King was not a communist, as was initially alleged, but he was a philanderer. And people know that, you know that for a fact. And, and this, these wiretaps were put together and anonymously sent to King's home uh, along with a, uh, a letter basically saying, you know, you're a complete fraud, look at all this stuff, you have only one way out, obviously suicide. And it created a kind of crisis within uh, you know, King's household that he and his wife moved through, but it gives you an idea of how vicious the FBI's tactics could be toward Martin Luther King in, in particular and the civil rights movement in general. This is an entry on Martin Luther King and the FBI rabble rouser index as in 1967 and as late as February 1968, uh, just two months before his assassination, 
you have a CIA summary that says, according to the FBI, Dr. King is regarded in communist circles as a genuine Marxist-Leninist who is following the Marxist-Leninist line. So even after the FBI really knew better, knew that King was not a communist, that they, they were still trumpeting that particular line. So you can't say that the, that the federal executive branch uh, is supporting the civil rights movement when you have this kind of thing going on. Congress. If you look at the former Confederate states, the 11 uh, uh, states of the former Confederacy, 43% of House Democrats and 45% of Senate Dem Democrats came from those areas, from the, from the former Confederacy. If you can uh, include the border states uh, where slavery had been legal during the American Civil War, you've got 55% of the House and 60% of the Senate. That meant that uh, the Kennedy administration, if it wanted to get, get its uh, a, a domestic agenda through at all, uh, had, to, to, had to tread very gingerly where civil rights was concerned. And the legislative branch you know, had tremendous power to, to push back against civil rights. Uh, it could and it did for quite some time. In fact, every uh, uh, Southern senator, with the exception of, of two, uh, who were interested in national office. One of them was Lyndon B. Johnson. The other one was uh, uh, Senator Al, former Senator Al, Al Gore's uh, father, Albert Gore. Uh, signed off on something called the Southern Manifesto, which was written by uh, a senator from, uh, from Virginia and another senator from Georgia. And if you take a look at the Southern Manifesto, it talks about an unwarranted decision by the Supreme Court. It's talking about Brown versus Board of Education here. Uh, Saying that, you know, talking about the naked power uh, for established law, a clear abuse of judicial power. Uh, it talks about you know, the federal judiciary trying to undertake in derogation of the authority of Congress and encroaching upon the reserved rights of the states and the people. So here is a, what they call a Declaration of Constitutional Principles. It comes out in 1956. It is signed off on again by most members of the, uh, uh, of the Southern delegations of the U.S. Senate. It gives you an idea of the, the, the fierceness with which Southern Democrats oppose the civil rights movement. Well, here you have President Lyndon B. Johnson. Now, Lyndon B. Johnson is a real friend to the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, and yet, when he dealt with, uh, with uh, Martin Luther King, he was constantly trying to get Martin Luther King to slow down the pace of uh, the activities of the, the civil rights uh, movement, uh, to move, move things forward, but to move things forward at a deliberate slow, uh, slow pace, a pace that was much less than what Martin Luther King and other civil rights movement leaders uh, wanted there to be. So. Another way to look at the insurgency is to think in terms of the civil rights movement being beatable. And what I mean by that is we tend to look at the civil rights movement success as being inevitable. That somehow or other, at this particular time in history, nice white people, you know, gave African Americans their civil rights and their voting rights and that it just sort of, it was just bound to happen. Well, it wasn't bound to happen. And there are about nine reasons why it was not, bound, why it was not a, a guaranteed success. This highlights the role of contingency in all of this. This highlights the, uh, uh, the ways in which the civil rights movement had to be very canny, very strategic, uh, be tactically adroit in order to achieve its aims. Number one, white conservatives had prevailed during Reconstruction. And Reconstruction is a period of time in which you see uh, three constitutional amendments, the first that destroyed slavery, a second one that defined citizenship as national, and a third one that guaranteed voting rights to everyone. Reconstruction conservatives had nullified uh, effectively two of those uh, amendments and did a great deal to sort of chip away at the third, even the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. So if they prevailed during Reconstruction, there was no particular reason why they couldn't prevail again against the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, there was this analog to prohibition. The idea that you could not you know, legislate cultural behavior. Prohibition had failed, the argument went, and, and, and so uh, desegregation was, was bound to fail because culturally whites would oppose it. Um, uh, President Eisenhower uh, is, is on record as having said that anybody who thinks that you can change people's views on race and racism uh, by, by dint of law is just plain nuts. And nuts was in all caps the way that Eisenhower uh, wrote it. The idea that you've got allies in the executive branch, 
Not particularly. You've got questionable presidential will to pursue all of this. That's a reason why the civil rights movement was beatable. There's a substantial grip uh, on, by the segregationists on congressional power. It's easy to explore, exploit fears, and they did, that the, cold, of the uh, cold War fears that the civil, members of the civil rights movement were, were communists, were, against, were not patriotic Americans, and were dangerous, uh, therefore. Most whites within the American South were opposed to desegregation. White moderates in the South, and my, aunts, my family and so forth would have been white moderates in this paper, were tepid. I mean, my family could have gone either way about civil rights. We didn't get involved on either side. We didn't, we did, we didn't get involved in favor of civil rights. We didn't, get, we didn't get involved against it. But what happened was we just simply accepted the status quo, whatever the status quo was. So Southern moderates didn't really have uh, you know, much in the game, whereas Southern extremists were very well organized and very powerful. Most whites outside the South were complacent about the pace of desegregation. What do I mean by this? Well, take a look at the Gallup polls. June uh, of 1961, an approval of the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision. You've got, what, 38% nationally who either disapproved or had no opinion about uh, the uh, Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision. And in the American South, the, the uh, approval rate is only one quarter, and a very, you've got very powerful uh, disapproval going on. 1962 and 1963, do you think that the Kennedy administration is pushing racial integration too fast or not fast enough? 42% of Americans nationally said that it was proceeding too fast, this at a time when desegregation had barely gotten underway. The following year, 1963, this is after Birmingham and... Uh, uh, and the, uh, the March on Washington and Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, the idea that integration was being pushed too fast had actually risen to 50%. So then you've got an, a, a white population nationally that is lukewarm at best about the civil rights movement. So another reason the civil rights movement was, was, was beatable, because you have a constitutional division of authority within the United States that gave state governments a substantial amount of control and made it difficult for the federal government to get involved uh, within the states uh, to assist the civil rights movement even if it was disposed uh, to do so. And then finally, uh, there are new coercive mechanisms that came into place. White citizen councils who used economic leverage uh, to intimidate uh, whites who were in favor of the civil rights movement, to intimidate African Americans by making it difficult for them to get mortgages or foreclosing on them or, in, or uh, involving themselves in other kinds of, uh, of activity that, that citizens within a town with real clout could wield. And there are about 250,000 in these white citizens councils. And then you have uh, a revitalized Ku Klux Klan with a membership of about 50,000, a kind of paramilitary organization. And then organizations like the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which basically uh, clandestinely uh, investigated uh, anybody who was associated in any way, shape, or form with the civil rights uh, movement. So the strategic task of the civil rights movement, and this is my lame attempt to, at, at animation on this, is to take the, uh, uh, the federal government here, which for a century had tacitly supported the segregationist order in the American South here at, uh, and uh, at, at sort of pushing down African Americans and, and, and blocking them. What you had to do was get the federal government, this is cool, <laughs> get the federal government you know, on the side of the uh, civil rights movement. And this was a difficult task, as I hope that I've established. How do you do it? Well, first of all, you're, you're dealing here with a complex insurgency. Because of the prominence of Martin Luther King, there's the idea that Martin Luther King uh, sort of ran the entire civil rights movement. He did not. He was one leader among many. And so you have uh, different organizations with different ideas about how to pursue uh, the civil rights movement. You had rivalries among the leaders and uh, the leadership. So the NAACP preferred legal action. Uh, Martin Luther King's group, the S Southern Christian Leadership Council, preferred the boycott, moral suasion. The, so the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, on the other hand, uh, encouraged you know, in sort of invading white spaces, 
with sit-ins, uh, like the famous 1961 sit-in at the Woolworth uh, lunch counter, uh, or the 1963 sit-in in Jackson, Mississippi. Congress on Racial Equality also had uh, sit-ins. They also had freedom rides, community organization, and then, of course, you had organizations like the Deacons for Defense that believed in armed self-defense. So all of these organizations, again, had rivalries, had different, different, uh, different approaches, and so what, you had, what, what needed to happen, and what did happen, was that functionally, these organizations uh, had a common adversary. The common adversary were the, the segregationist uh, regimes in the American South. And functionally, not in terms of a top-down leadership way, but functionally, organically, uh, worked to topple uh, these, uh, uh, these governments. How do you do this? Nowadays, when you're dealing with insurgencies and counterinsurgencies, uh, a major tenet in counterinsurgency is, is to get control of the narrative, get control of the story, uh, and, and create a story of liberation and good government in contrast to the insurgents' story of injustice, redress of, of, of grievances, um, uh, you know, religious, you know, religious objectives of various kinds, and so forth. So an important uh, measure within, within, an, within an insurgency or counterinsurgency, either one, is to get control of the narrative, you know, what people see, what people, what people think, what people believe. And the key tactic was to force overreactions on the part of segregationist government, segregationist leaders, and make sure that the press was there to photograph it, to report it. There's one occasion when Martin Luther King uh, saw a photographer put down his camera and go to the aid of a young girl who was being attacked by uh, a, uh, uh, a southern policeman you know, during, during the, one of these demonstrations. And King went to this photographer and rebuked him and basically said, I don't want to be cold-blooded about this, but it is so much more important that you photograph this event than that you become a participant in it. And he was exactly right from an insurgency point of view because it, it, was, it was publicizing these kinds of overreactions, publicizing this, this sort of bullying that roused the American population you know, uh, within the South, outside the South. And this, didn't, this, this tactic did not always work because sometimes uh, law enforcement understood what uh, the, the, the nonviolent part of the civil rights movement was trying to accomplish. This is Police Chief Lori Pritchett in Albany, Georgia in 1962. Uh, and, this, and, and Lori Pritchett uh, understood what the civil rights movement was trying to uh, accomplish. Why? Because he read Martin Luther King's books. Why? Because he had read the nonviolent resistance strategies uh, created by Mahatma Gandhi which greatly influenced uh, the nonviolent wing of the, uh, of the civil rights movement. And so what he did was he trained his own police force in, um, uh, in restraint. He also knew that a basic tactic of the civil rights movement was to flood the local jails uh, with people who, who almost intentionally got themselves arrested because once you flooded the jails, you took away one of the major tools of law enforcement, the ability uh, to jail people. So by, flooding, by, by following a, a policy called jail no bail, uh, the civil rights movement was able to sort of you know, take away one of the key weapons uh, in the law enforcement arsenal. Well, what Laura Pritchett did was he, he quietly but persistently went around to uh, the, the sheriffs and police chiefs and so forth in towns around Albany going out for about 50 miles in any direction and was able to get them to agree to take uh, any uh, uh, civil rights resistors who got arrested and take them into their jails to hold them uh, on behalf of the city authorities of Albany, Georgia. And that meant that this jail no bail tactic completely uh, failed because uh, Pritchett was able to absorb whatever the, the civil rights movement attempted uh, to do. Now, troublemakers would come into 
uh, Albany. This is, a, this is an American Nazi. Uh, and you can see him copying an attitude and so forth. And you can see uh, uh, Police Chief Laurie Pritchett about to run this guy out of town because this is, you know, this is not the kind of public face that Pritchett wanted the world to see. You've got, you've got the press coming in to, uh, to look at the civil rights movement and what it's trying to accomplish. Martin Luther King comes in uh, to be part of this, what's, what's called this Albany movement. And, uh, and instead of antagonizing the press, which is what commonly occurred, uh, what Pritchett did instead was treated them like bosom buddies. So here you are, member of the press, and I'm, you know, I'm right here to be your buddy, and I'm going to tell you, you know, you want a story, right, because you're a journalist? Sure. I'm going to tell you where the next exciting, interesting thing is going to occur. It's going to occur right over there. So, you know, so be there and, and, after, you know, and report on that story, and afterward we'll get together for a beer. You know, this, is the way, this is the way Pritchett handled things. And he, you know, this, there was just, this was, Albany is sort of famous as a major defeat for the civil rights movement because in Laurie Pritchett you had somebody that in insurgency terms was an effective counterinsurgent who waged an effective counterinsurgency. So what the civil rights movement then had to do, what, what Martin Luther King's organization then had to do was to find a place where you were definitely going to get overreactions. And they turned their attention to Birmingham, Alabama. It was called Bombingham. Alabama because there was so much violence there uh, against the civil rights movement that was already in the town. They created something called Project C, Project C for Confrontation. And they were dealing with the director of public safety there, a guy named Bull O'Connor. Bull Connor. Uh, and they knew, that, or they could reasonably have expected to know, that Connor was going to be the kind of person who was going to overreact. And he, and he overreacted notwithstanding the fact that Laurie Pritchett from Albany, Georgia, was brought in as a consultant to try to and, and argue that things needed to be reined in and explain how things had been done uh, in Albany. What happened is that Connor turned loose uh, the fire department and, uh, and the police department on demonstrators and you get these, uh, you get these photographs taken in one of the uh, one of the key demonstrator demonstrations. Now you might think getting, getting hit with a fire hose is no big deal. This is not a garden hose. This, is coming, this water is coming out at such pressures that it can strip bark from trees at a, at a distance of about 100 yards. That's just, how, uh, that's just how powerful this thing is. And, these, uh, and this water could just knock people off their feet and did. Here, here are, here's a group of people who are uh, you know, just up against a, up against a wall uh, being hit by this stuff. And this is, this is hitting them with the force, of a, the force of a fist that's just continually pushing at them. Here you have a, a young African-American man beset by police dogs. And of course, you've got photographs of all of this going on by the American press. And here it all, it all hits the New York Times. And look at what you've got. Two of those pictures making the, the front page of the New York Times. This was a public... Uh, a, Public, uh, 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 public relations disaster for Birmingham. And the businessmen and, and uh, civic leaders in Birmingham basically said, we can't afford this. We can't afford Birmingham to take this kind of black eye. This is bad for business. It will drive business away. And so what happened was within a couple of weeks of these demonstrations, uh, the civic leaders of Birmingham cut a deal with the civil rights movement to change things. Uh, in, in Birmingham and to move toward desegregation and a more civil relationship between uh, the races uh, in Birmingham. Now, it is uh, Birmingham and some other events that lead to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. John F. Kennedy uh, reluctantly uh, really gets behind the Civil Rights Act. He's, a, he's assassinated before it can be passed but his successor, President Lyndon B. Johnson, really uses uh, Kennedy's assassination as a tool to say, we've got to pass the Civil Rights Act, not only because it's just to do so, but also because it, it will be a kind of a legacy or a memorial or a tribute to our slain pres president. But having done that, Johnson told uh, uh, Martin Luther King, who was then pressing for a Voting Rights Act, and after all, it's political access that really matters here, he tells Johnson that basically white people have absorbed enough change for a while and not to press for a Voting Rights Act. King does anyway. 
And his, and his target this time, when you think about it, is not so much the segregationists in the American, in the American South. His target is President Lyndon B. Johnson, to force Johnson to act. And so uh, Martin Luther King's organization and other organizations begin to look for another Birmingham, another place where you're going to get uh, an overreaction. And they find their overreaction on, on, in, the, uh, in the guise of this particular uh, uh, police chief in Selma, Alabama. Now there is a director of public safety here, uh, a guy named Baker Wilson, uh, who is trying to keep things under control, keep things restrained, but this, uh, but this particular police chief uh, cannot restrain himself. He tries for a while, and then in one demonstration, he gets so upset with a woman who's trying to register to vote in Selma that he clocks her in front of the press. You know? And of course, this is a public relations disaster. This disaster deepens when uh, on, uh, in March of 1965, there's a, an event called Bloody Sunday when uh, African-American uh, civil rights resistors conduct a symbolic march uh, across, attempt to cross the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, in Selma and they are set upon by local police, by highway patrol, some of them mounted on horses, and they are attacked, as you can see. And, and this is all covered by the press. Once again, you've got a photograph of this because there's the, 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 the event is well publicized. The press is there to watch this. Now, that evening, that evening uh, on ABC, uh, a film is being shown called Judgment at Nuremberg. Have you ever seen the film Judgment at Nuremberg? Okay, if you haven't, you ought to see it. Nominally, it is about the trial of Nazi judges uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. You know, you've got the famous Nazi war criminals, uh, the, you know, various field marshals, people like Hermann Goering and so forth, but you've also got other people who were involved and there was a, there was a sort of a second round of of trials involving these, these former German uh, uh, judges. But the real moral of Judgment at Nuremberg is that it's a film really about the complicity of ordinary people with evil. So this film is on TV and then ABC cuts in for a 15 minute special report showing footage from what's going on in Selma, uh, Alabama. And the juxtaposition is impossible to miss. And hundreds of Americans, white Americans, black Americans, get in their cars, get on planes, find their way to Selma, Alabama to join the civil rights uh, movement. There is a successful march um, uh, from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, the result is that President Lyndon Johnson, very shortly, finds himself signing off on the very law that he said you know, needed to wait, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, the political, the, the, sorry, the, the Prussian military theorist Karl von Clausewitz talks about a culminating point of victory, a point where you've, where you've, you've gotten as far as you go, as you can go, and then uh, your offensive loses momentum. So there's a culminating point beyond which you can't go. The culminating point uh, in terms of the civil rights movement, the civil rights insurgency, uh, is the Voting Rights Act. Because what happens within a few weeks of the passage of the Voting Rights Act is a major uh, race riot in Watts, the district of Watts in Los Angeles. Stokely Carmichael of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, SNCC, goes from a policy of nonviolence to uh, a, a watchword that is black power. What we want here is black power. He says this, and he, and he says this in a very public way and so on. And in some, in some respects, black power is a call to, uh, to black pride and a call to recover uh, and to celebrate black culture, black history, and so forth. But it is also a political uh, battle cry, a, a, a cry that is directed toward greater militants, a cry that is, great, uh, that is uh, di directed toward greater confrontation, and a cry that, can be, that, that arguably sounds like a rejection of nonviolence. Martin Luther King was appalled 
uh, by the selection of, black, of, of the term black power. In some respects, he understood it as an expression of frustration on the part of civil rights leaders like Stokely Carmichael, but in other kinds of ways, he knew exactly what was going to happen. It was going to cost control over the narrative. And King himself contributed to the loss of control over the narrative by uh, moving, now that he'd achieved uh, voting rights for, uh, for African Americans, moving in the direction of opposition to the Vietnam War, moving in the direction of saying that uh, we've achieved political equality, but political equality without the redress of all of the, all the economic inequality in the country uh, was going to be a kind of a hollow victory. And when King moved in the direction of looking for economic justice, you put these different events uh, together and then the rise of the Black Panther po uh, Party, uh, first in Alabama and then most famously in Oakland, California. And this all to the white press, you know, the white dominated press, you know, changes the narrative. You know, because now the civil rights movement you know, no longer looks uh, like sort of inoffensive Americans petitioning for, the, for their rights, being bullied and brooded, and brooded about. What's, uh, you know, what, what now looks like is that the civil rights movement begins to look dangerous, begins to look militant. I mean, you know, because after all, you know, journalists like you, you're interested in a story. And the story now, the interesting story is, you know, what does all this mean? Black power, rioting in the streets, opposition to the Vietnam War, you know, militants uh, you know, posturing with uh, weapons and bandoliers and so forth. What does this all mean? Well, it means something scary. It means something dangerous. Before I, 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 I stop, I need to talk a little bit about black self-defense groups. Again, here is Robert, Robert F. Williams and his wife, the, NS, the, the head of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina who winds up, by the way, having to leave the country and go to Cuba because of his interest in black self-defense. And then you have these Deacons for Defense and Justice, which began in Bogalusa, Louisiana, and wound up having chapters uh, across much of Louisiana and Mississippi. And to repeat, these are veterans of the Korean War, veterans of the Second World War, and as veterans they understand military organization, they understand military discipline, they understand tactics, uh, they even standardized their ammunition using 30 caliber in, uh, ammunition, some of which they got, by the way, from the National Rifle Association, which is happy to give ammunition to anybody who, who petitions for it or asks for it. Uh, and this organization uh, managed to accomplish a significant amount simply by dint of its existence. Because local leaders who might have simply defied uh, desegregation orders and, and so on, particularly because they weren't pushed very hard by the Department of, of, of Justice, understood that, be, that behind, the, that next to the nonviolent uh, contingent of the Civil Rights Movement, you had these, these men who, for the moment, were simply defending their neighborhoods against encroachment by the Ku Klux Klan, but if frustrated enough, could turn a nonviolent insurgency into a violent insurgency. And so what you wind up having, really, are two aspects of the civil rights movement, a nonviolent wing and, uh, and a self, not a violent wing, but a, 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 a wing oriented towards self-defense that achieve you know, functionally things that neither group could have achieved on their own. Because the, uh, the militant wing of the, of the civil rights movement, as it were, operating alone would have been threatening in the same way that I just, just showed you with the advent of black power and so on. The nonviolent wing by itself could have been simply uh, ignored uh, or muted or in some way nullified by segregationists. But put them both together and they were able to achieve synergistically objectives they would not have been able to achieve uh, on their own. If you never, if you've never, don't know anything about the Deacons for Defense, there is a very good film made by our Arts and Entertainment, uh, Arts, uh, the A&E, and uh, you can get it. You know, it's not very expensive. You can rent it and watch it and so on, and then you know, there it is. In this one, they're carrying AR-15s, pretty well-armed people. Why does it matter? This is, let me bring this all in for a landing. Why does it matter to call the civil rights movement an insurgency? Well, it has implications for my own field, the field of military history. 
uh, by expanding its boundaries, by causing us to question uh, the intellectual parameters of our field and sort of push them out. Uh, because so far, military historians really think about uh, our field in terms of violent resistance. But the idea of expanding our field to include nonviolent resistance, you know, which can achieve the same results as violent resistance, you know, and perhaps achieve it in circumstances where violent resistance would be futile, is, I think, an important direction in which our field can go and, in my opinion, needs to go. Uh, implications for COIN. Remember I gave this at the Army War College, and, and everybody knows what COIN stands for, the Army War College or in the, mil uh, the, mil or the military. It stands for counterinsurgency. So, and it, so it, has, it has the effect, really, of getting us to rethink uh, insurgency, not just in terms of violent insurgency, but again in terms of nonviolent insurgency. But to me, the most important part of it by far is its implications for the study of the civil rights era. Because it brings together a great deal of our, of our comprehension of the nonviolent uh, aspects of the movement and the, the, the self-defense groups and creates a kind of a new and I think coherent lens through which to understand the movement. It also reinforces, and I think this really cannot be emphasized enough, the element of contingency and the strategic and tactical brilliance of the movement to achieve objectives that might very well have failed without, with a less adroit strategy, a less adroit set of, of tactics. And that is the end of my presentation.